Chrome Yellow by Aldous Huxley Read for LibriVox.org by Martin Clifton Chapter 21 Perched on its four stone mushrooms, the little granary stood two or three feet above the grass of the green close. Beneath it there was a perpetual shade and a damp growth of long, luxuriant grasses. Here, in the shadow, in the green dampness, a family of white ducks had sought shelter from the afternoon sun. Some stood, preening themselves, some reposed with their long bellies pressed to the ground, as though the cool grass were water. Little social noises burst fitfully forth, and from time to time some pointed tail would execute a brilliant Lystian tremolo. Suddenly their jovial response was shattered. A prodigious thump shook the wooden flooring above their heads. The whole granary trembled. Little fragments of dirt and crumbled wood rained down among them. With a loud, continuous quacking, the ducks rushed out from beneath this nameless menace, and did not stay their flight till they were safely in the farmyard. "'Don't lose your temper,' Anne was saying. "'Listen, you've frightened the ducks. Poor dears, no wonder.' She was sitting sideways in a low wooden chair. Her right elbow rested on the back of the chair, and she supported her cheek on her hand. Her long, slender body drooped into curves of a lazy grace. She was smiling, and she looked at Gombold through half-closed eyes. "'Damn you!' Gombold repeated, and stamped his foot again. He glared at her round the half-finished portrait on the easel. "'Poor ducks!' Anne repeated. The sound of their quacking was faint in the distance. It was inaudible. "'Can't you see you make me lose my time?' he asked. "'I can't work with you dangling about distractingly like this. "'You'd lose less time if you stopped talking and stamping your feet "'and did a little painting for a change. "'After all, what am I dangling about for, except to be painted?' "'Gombold made a noise like a growl. "'You're awful,' he said, with conviction. "'Why do you ask me to come and stay here? "'Why do you tell me you'd like me to paint your portrait?' "'For the simple reason that I like you, at least when you're in a good temper, "'and that I think you're a good painter.' "'For the simple reason,' Gombold mimicked her voice, "'that you want me to make love to you, and, when I do, to have the amusement of running away.' Anne threw back her head and laughed. "'So you think it amuses me to have to evade your advances? So like a man! If you only knew how gross and awful and boring men are when they try to make love, and you don't want them to make love. If you could only see yourselves through our eyes!' Gombold picked up his palette and brushes, and attacked his canvas with the ardour of irritation. "'I suppose you'll be saying next that you didn't start the game, that it was I who made the first advances, and that you were the innocent victim who sat still and never did anything that could invite or allure me on.' "'So like a man again,' said Anne. "'It's always the same old story about the woman tempting the man. The woman lures, fascinates, invites, and man, noble man, innocent man, falls a victim.' "'My poor Gombold, surely you're not going to sing that old song again. "'It's so unintelligent, and I always thought you were a man of sense.' "'Thanks,' said Gombold. "'Be a little objective,' Anne went on. "'Can't you see that you're simply externalising your own emotions? "'That's what you men are always doing. It's so barbarously naive. "'You feel one of your loose desires for some woman, "'and, because you desire her strongly, "'you immediately accuse her of luring you on.' of deliberately provoking and inviting the desire. You have the mentality of savages. You might just as well say that a plate of strawberries and cream deliberately lures you on to feel greedy. In ninety-nine cases out of a hundred, women are as passive and innocent as the strawberries and cream. Well, all I can say is that this must be the hundredth case, said Gombold, without looking up. Anne shrugged her shoulders and gave vent to a sigh. I'm at a loss to know whether you're more silly or more rude. After painting for a little time in silence, Gombold began to speak again. And then there's Dennis, he said, renewing the conversation as though it had only just been broken off. You're playing the same game with him. Why can't you leave that wretched young man in peace? Anne flushed with a sudden and uncontrollable anger. It's perfectly untrue about Dennis, she said indignantly. I never dreamt of playing what you beautifully call the same game with him. Recovering her calm, she added in her ordinary cooing voice and with her exacerbating smile, "'You've become very protective towards poor Dennis all of a sudden.' "'I have,' Gombold replied, 
with a gravity that was somehow a little too solemn. "'I don't like to see a young man being whirled along the road to ruin,' said Anne, continuing his sentence for him. "'I admire your sentiments, and, believe me, I share them.' She was curiously irritated at what Gombold had said about Dennis. It happened to be so completely untrue. Gombold might have some slight ground for his reproaches. But Dennis, no. She had never flirted with Dennis. Poor boy, he was very sweet. She became somewhat pensive. Gombold painted on with fury the restlessness of an unsatisfied desire, which, before had distracted his mind, making work impossible, seemed now to have converted itself into a kind of feverish energy. When it was finished, he told himself the portrait would be diabolic. He was painting her in the pose she had naturally adopted at the first sitting, seated sideways, her elbow on the back of the chair, her head and shoulders turned at an angle from the rest of her body, towards the front, she had fallen into an attitude of indolent abandonment. He had emphasised the lazy curves of her body, the lines sagged as they crossed the canvas. The grace of the painted figure seemed to be melting into a kind of soft decay. The hand that lay along the knee was as limp as a glove. He was at work on the face now. It had begun to emerge on the canvas, doll-like in its regularity and listlessness. It was Anne's face, but her face as it would be, utterly unillumined by the inward lights of thought and emotion. It was the lazy, expressionless mask which was sometimes her face. The portrait was terribly like, and at the same time it was the most malicious of lies. Yes, it would be diabolic when it was finished, Gumbold decided. He wondered what she would think of it. End of chapter Chrome Yellow by Aldous Huxley, read for LibriVox.org by Martin Clifton. Chapter 22 For the sake of peace and quiet, Dennis had returned earlier on this same afternoon to his bedroom. He wanted to work, but the hour was a drowsy one, and lunch, so recently eaten, weighed heavily on body and mind. The meridian demon was upon him. He was possessed by that bored and hopeless postprandial melancholy which the Coenobites of old knew and feared under the name of Acidi. He felt, like Ernest Dowson, a little weary. He was in the mood to write something rather exquisite and gentle, and quietest in tone. Something a little droopy, and at the same time, how should he put it, a little infinite. He thought of Anne, of love hopeless and unattainable. Perhaps that was the ideal kind of love, the hopeless kind, the quiet, theoretical kind of love. In this sad mood of repletion, he could well believe it. He began to write. An elegant quatrain had flowed from beneath his pen. A brooding love which is, at most, the stealth of moonbeams when they slide, evoking colour's bloodless ghost, or some scarce-breathing breast or side, when his attention was attracted by a sound from outside. He looked down from his window. There they were, Anne and Gombold, talking, laughing together. They crossed the courtyard in front, and passed out of sight through the gate in the right-hand wall. That was the way to the green close in the granary. She was going to sit for him again. His pleasantly depressing melancholy was dissipated by a puff of violent emotion. Angrily he threw his quatrain into the waste-paper basket, and ran downstairs. The stealth of moonbeams, indeed! In the hall he saw Mr. Scogan. The man seemed to be lying in wait. Dennis tried to escape, but in vain. Mr. Scogan's eye glittered like the eye of the ancient mariner. Not so fast, he said, stretching out a small saurian hand with pointed nails. Not so fast. I was just going down to the flower garden to take the sun. We'll go together. Dennis abandoned himself. Mr. Scogan put on his hat, and they went out arm in arm. On the shaven turf of the terrace, Henry Wimbush and Mary were playing a solemn game of bowls. They descended by the yew-tree walk. It was here, thought Dennis, here that Anne had fallen, here that he had kissed her, here, and he blushed with retrospective shame at the memory, here that he had tried to carry her and failed. Life was awful. "'Sanity,' said Mr. Scogan, suddenly breaking a long silence. "'Sanity. That's what's wrong with me, and that's what will be wrong with you, my dear Dennis, when you're old enough to be sane or insane. In a sane world, I should be a great man. As things are in this curious establishment, I am nothing at all. To all intents and purposes, 
I don't exist. I am just vox et praeterea nihil. Dennis made no response. He was thinking of other things. After all, he said to himself, after all, Gombold is better looking than I, more entertaining, more confident, and, besides, he's already somebody, and I'm still only potential. Everything that gets done in this world is done by madmen, Mr. Scogan went on. Dennis tried not to listen, but the tireless insistent of Mr. Scogan's discourse gradually compelled his attention. Men such as I am, such as you may possibly become, have never achieved anything. We're too sane, we're merely reasonable. We lack the human touch, the compelling, enthusiastic mania. People are quite ready to listen to the philosophers for a little amusement, just as they would listen to a fiddler or a mountebank. But as to acting on the advice of the man of reason, never. Whenever the choice has had to be made between the man of reason and the madman, the world has unhesitatingly followed the madman. For the madman appeals to what is fundamental, to passion and the instincts. The philosophers to what is superficial and supererogatory, reason. They entered the garden. At the head of one of the alleys stood a green wooden bench, embayed in the midst of a fragrant continent of lavender bushes. It was here, though the place was shadeless and one breathed hot, dry perfume instead of air, it was here that Mr. Scogan elected to sit. He thrived on untempered sunlight. Consider, for example, the case of Luther and Erasmus. He took out his pipe and began to fill it as he talked. There was Erasmus, a man of reason if ever there was one. People listened to him at first. A new virtuoso, performing on that elegant and resourceful instrument, the intellect. They even admired and venerated him. But did he move them to behave as he wanted them to behave, reasonably, decently, or at least a little less porkishly than usual? He did not. And then Luther appears, violent, passionate, a madman, insanely convinced about matters in which there can be no conviction. He shouted and men rushed to follow him. Erasmus was no longer listened to. He was reviled for his reasonableness. Luther was serious. Luther was reality, like the Great War. Erasmus was only reason and decency. He lacked the power, being a sage, to move men to action. Europe followed Luther, and embarked on a century and a half of war and bloody persecution. It's a melancholy story. Mr. Scogan lighted a match. In the intense light the flame was all but invisible. The smell of burning tobacco began to mingle with the sweetly acrid smell of the lavender. If you want to get man to act reasonably, you must set about persuading them in a maniacal manner. The very sane precepts of the founders of religions are only made infectious by means of enthusiasms which to a sane man must appear deplorable. It is humiliating to find how impotent unadulterated sanity is. Sanity, for example, informs us that the only way in which we can preserve civilization is by behaving decently and intelligently. Sanity appeals and argues. Our rulers persevere in their customary porkishness while we acquiesce and obey. The only hope is a maniacal crusade. I am ready when it comes to beat a tambourine with the loudest, but at the same time I shall feel a little ashamed of myself. However, Mr. Scogan shrugged his shoulders and, pipe in hand, made a gesture of resignation. It's futile to complain that things are as they are. The fact remains that sanity, unassisted, is useless. What we want, then, is a sane and reasonable exploitation of the forces of insanity. We sane men will have the power yet. Mr. Scogan's eyes shone with a more than ordinary brightness, and, taking his pipe out of his mouth, he gave vent to his loud, dry, and somehow rather fiendish laugh. "'But I don't want power,' said Dennis. He was sitting in limp discomfort at one end of the bench, shading his eyes from the intolerable light. Mr. Scogan, bolt upright at the other end, laughed again. "'Everybody wants power,' he said, "'power in some form or other. The sort of power you hanker for is literary power. Some people want power to persecute other human beings. You expend your lust for power in persecuting words, twisting them, moulding them, torturing them to obey you. But I divagate. Do you? asked Dennis faintly. Yes, Mr. Scogan continued unheeding. The time will come. We men of intelligence will learn to harness the insanities to the service of reason. We can't leave the world any longer to the direction of chance. We can't allow dangerous maniacs like Luther, mad about dogma, like Napoleon, mad about himself, 
to go on casually appearing and turning everything upside down. In the past it didn't so much matter, but our modern machine is too delicate. A few more knocks like the Great War, another Luther or two, and the whole concern will go to pieces. In future, the men of reason must see that the madness of the world's maniacs is canalized into proper channels, is made to do useful work like a mountain torrent driving a dynamo. Making electricity to light a Swiss hotel, said Dennis, you ought to complete the simile. Mr. Scogan waved away the interruption. There's only one thing to be done, he said. The men of intelligence must combine, must conspire, and seize power from the imbeciles and maniacs who now direct us. They must found the rational state. The heat that was slowly paralysing all Dennis's mental and bodily faculties seemed to bring to Mr. Scogan additional vitality. He talked with an ever-increasing energy, his hands moved in sharp, quick, precise gestures, his eyes shone. Hard, dry, and continuous, his voice went on sounding and sounding in Dennis's ears with the insistence of mechanical noise. In the rational state, he heard Mr. Scogan saying, human beings will be separated out into distinct species, not according to the colour of their eyes or the shape of their skulls, but according to the qualities of their mind and temperament. Examining psychologists, trained to what would now seem an almost superhuman clairvoyance, will test each child that is born and assign it to its proper species. Duly labelled and docketed, the child will be given the education suitable to members of its species, and it will be set in adult life to perform those functions which human beings of his variety are capable of performing. "'How many species will there be?' asked Dennis. "'A great many, no doubt,' Mr. Scogan answered. "'The classification will be subtle and elaborate, but it is not in the power of a prophet to go into details.' nor is it his business. I will do more than indicate the three main species into which the subjects of the rational state will be divided. He paused, cleared his throat, and coughed once or twice, evoking in Dennis's mind the vision of a table with a glass and water bottle, and, lying across one corner, a long white pointer for the lantern pictures. Three main species, Mr. Skoken went on, will be these. The directing intelligence, the men of faith, and the herd. Among the intelligences will be found all those capable of thought, those who know how to attain a certain degree of freedom, and, alas, how limited even among the most intelligent that freedom is, from the mental bondage of their time. A select body of intelligences drawn from among those who have turned their attention to the problem of practical life will be the governors of the rational state. They will employ as their instruments of power the second great species of humanity, the men of faith, the madmen, as I have been calling them, who believe in things unreasonably, with passion, and are ready to die for their beliefs and their desires. These wild men, with their fearful potentialities for good or for mischief, will no longer be allowed to react casually to a casual environment. There will be no more Caesar Borgias, no more Luthers and Mohammeds, no more Joanna Southcots, no more Comstocks. The old-fashioned man of faith and desire, that haphazard creature of brute circumstance, who might drive men to tears and repentance, or who might equally well set them on to cutting one another's throats, will be replaced by a new sort of madman, still externally the same, still bubbling with a seemingly spontaneous enthusiasm, but, ah, uh, how very different from the madman of the past. For the new man of faith will be expending his passion, his desire, and his enthusiasm in the propagation of some reasonable idea, he will be, all unawares, the tool of some superior intelligence. Mr. Scogan chuckled maliciously. It was as though he were taking a revenge, in the name of reason, on enthusiasts. From their earliest years, as soon, that is, as the examining psychologists have assigned them their place in the classified scheme, the men of faith will have had their special education under the eye of the intelligences. Moulded by a long process of suggestion, they will go out into the world, preaching and practising with a generous mania the coldly reasonable projects of the directors from above. When these projects are accomplished, or when the ideas that were useful a decade ago have ceased to be useful, the intelligences will inspire a new generation of madmen with a new eternal truth. The principal function of the men of faith will be to move and direct the multitude. That third great species consisting of those countless millions who lack intelligence and are without valuable enthusiasm.
when any particular effort is required of the herd when it is thought necessary for the sake of solidarity that humanity shall be kindled and united by some single enthusiastic desire or idea the men of faith primed with some simple and satisfying creed will be sent out on a mission of evangelization at ordinary times when the high spiritual temperature of a crusade would be unhealthy the men of faith will be quietly and earnestly busy with the great work of education in the upbringing of the herd humanity's almost boundless suggestibility will be scientifically exploited systematically from earliest infancy its members will be assured that there is no happiness to be found except in work and obedience they will be made to believe that they are happy that they are tremendously important beings and that everything they do is noble and significant for the lower species the earth will be restored to the center of the universe and man to preeminence on the earth oh i envy the lot of the commonality in the regional state working there eight hours a day obeying their betters convinced of their own grandeur and significance and immortality they will be marvelously happy happier than any race of men has ever been they will go through life in a rosy state of intoxication from which they will never awake the men of faith will play the cup-bearers at this lifelong bacchanal, filling and ever filling again with the warm liquor that the intelligences in sad and sober privacy behind the scenes will brew for the intoxication of their subjects. And what will be my place in the rational state? Dennis drowsily inquired from under his shading hand. Mr. Scogan looked at him for a moment in silence. It's difficult to see where you would fit in, he said at last. You couldn't do manual work. You're too independent and unsuggestible to belong to the larger herd. You have none of the characteristics required in a man of faith. As for the directing intelligences, they will have to be marvellously clear and mercilessly penetrating. He paused and shook his head. No, I can see no place for you, only the lethal chamber. Deeply hurt, Dennis emitted the imitation of a loud Homeric laugh. I'm getting sunstroke here, he said, and got up. Mr. Scogan followed his example, and they walked slowly away down the narrow path, brushing the blue lavender flowers in their passage. Dennis pulled a sprig of lavender and sniffed at it, then some dark leaves of rosemary that smelt like incense in a cavernous church. They passed a bed of opium poppies, dispetaled now, the round, ripe seed heads were brown and dry, like Polynesian trophies, Dennis thought severed heads stuck on poles. He liked the fancy enough to impart it to Mr. Scogan. Like Polynesian trophies, uttered aloud, the fancy seemed less charming and significant than it did when it first occurred to him. There was a silence, and in a growing wave of sound the whir of the reaping machines swelled up from the fields beyond the garden and then receded into a remoter hum. It is satisfactory to think, said Mr. Scogan, as they strolled slowly onward, that a multitude of people are toiling in the harvest fields in order that we may talk of Polynesia. Like every other good thing in this world, leisure and culture have to be paid for. Fortunately, however, it is not the leisured and the cultured who have to pay. Let us be duly thankful for that, my dear Dennis, duly thankful, he repeated, and knocked the ashes out of his pipe. Dennis was not listening. He had suddenly remembered Anne. She was with Gombold, alone with him in his studio. It was an intolerable thought. "'Shall we go and pay a call on Gombold?' he suggested carelessly. "'It would be amusing to see what he's doing now.' He laughed inwardly to think how furious Gombold would be when he saw them arriving. End of chapter Chrome Yellow by Aldous Huxley Recorded for LibriVox.org by Martin Clifton Chapter 23 Gombold was by no means so furious at their apparition as Dennis had hoped and expected he would be. Indeed, he was rather pleased than annoyed when the two faces, one brown and pointed, the other round and pale, appeared in the frame of the open door. The energy born of his restless irritation was dying within him returning to its emotional elements. A moment more, and he would have been losing his temper again, and Anne would be keeping hers infuriatingly. Yes, he was positively glad to see them. "'Come in, come in,' he called out hospitably. 
Followed by Mr. Scogan, Dennis climbed the little ladder and stepped over the threshold. He looked suspiciously from Gombold to his sitter, and could learn nothing from the expression of their faces, except that they both seemed pleased to see the visitors. Were they really glad, or were they cunningly simulating gladness, he wondered. Mr. Scogan, meanwhile, was looking at the portrait. Excellent, he said, approvingly excellent. Almost too true to character, if that is possible. Yes, positively too true. But I'm surprised to find you putting in all this psychology business. He pointed to the face, and with his extended finger followed the slack curves of the painted figure. I thought you were one of the fellows who went in exclusively for balanced masses and impinging planes. Gombold laughed. This is a little infidelity, he said. I'm sorry, said Mr. Scogan. I, for one, without ever having had the slightest appreciation of painting, have always taken particular pleasure in cubismus. I like to see pictures from which nature has been completely banished, pictures which are exclusively the product of the human mind. They give me the same pleasure as I derive from a good piece of reasoning, or a mathematical problem, or an achievement of engineering. Nature, or anything that reminds me of nature, disturbs me. It is too large, too complicated, above all too utterly pointless and incomprehensible. I am at home with the works of man. If I choose to set my mind to it, I can understand anything that any man has made or thought. That is why I always travel by tube, never by bus, if I can possibly help it. For, travelling by bus, one can't avoid seeing, even in London, a few stray works of God, the sky, for example, an occasional tree, the flowers and the window boxes. But travel by tube, and you see nothing but the works of man, iron riveted into geometrical forms, straight lines of concrete, patterned expanses of tiles. All is human and the product of friendly and comprehensible minds. All philosophies and all religions, what are they but spiritual tubes bored through the universe, through these narrow tunnels, where all is recognizably human, one travels comfortable and secure, contriving to forget that all around and below and above them stretches the blind mass of the earth, endless and unexplored. Yes, give me the tube and cubismus every time. Give me ideas so snug and neat and simple and well made. And preserve me from nature, preserve me from all that's inhumanly large and complicated and obscure. I haven't the courage, and, above all, I haven't the time to start wandering in that labyrinth. While Mr. Scogan was discoursing, Dennis had crossed over to the farther side of the little square chamber, where Anne was sitting, still in her graceful, lazy pose on the low chair. Well, he demanded, looking at her almost fiercely. What was he asking of her? He hardly knew himself. Anne looked up at him, and for an answer echoed his, well, in another a laughing key. Dennis had nothing more at the moment to say. Two or three canvases stood in the corner behind Anne's chair, their faces turned to the wall. He pulled them out and began to look at the paintings. "'May I see two? Anne requested. He stood them in a row against the wall. Anne had to turn round in her chair to look at them. There was the big canvas of the man fallen from the horse, there was a painting of flowers, there was a small landscape. His hands on the back of the chair, Dennis leaned over her. From behind the easel, at the other side of the room, Mr. Scogan was talking away. For a long time they looked at the pictures saying nothing, or, rather, Anne looked at the pictures while Dennis, for the most part, looked at Anne. "'I like the man and the horse, don't you?' she said at last, looking up with an inquiring smile. Dennis nodded, and then, in a queer, strangled voice, as though it had cost him a great effort to utter the words, he said, "'I love you.' It was a remark which Anne had heard a good many times before, mostly heard with equanimity. But on this occasion, perhaps because they had come so unexpectedly, perhaps for some other reason, the words provoked in her a certain surprised commotion. "'My poor Dennis!' she managed to say with a laugh. But she was blushing as she spoke. End of chapter Chrome Yellow by Aldous Huxley, recorded for LibriVox.org 
by Martin Clifton. Chapter 24 It was noon. Dennis, descending from his chamber, where he had been making an unsuccessful effort to write something about nothing in particular, found the drawing-room deserted. He was about to go out into the garden when his eye fell on a familiar but mysterious object, the large red notebook in which he had so often seen Jenny quietly and busily scribbling. She had left it lying on the window-seat. The temptation was great. He picked up the book and slipped off the elastic band that kept it discreetly closed. Private, not to be opened, was written in capital letters on the cover. He raised his eyebrows. It was the sort of thing one wrote in one's Latin grammar, while one was still at one's preparatory school. Black is the raven, black is the rook, but blacker the thief who steals this book. It was curiously childish, he thought, and he smiled to himself. He opened the book. What he saw made him wince as though he had been struck. Dennis was his own severest critic, so at least he had always believed. He liked to think of himself as a merciless vivisector, probing into the palpitating entrails of his own soul. He was brown dog to himself. His weakness, his absurdities, no one knew them better than he did. Indeed, in a vague way, he imagined that nobody beside himself was aware of them at all. It seemed somehow inconceivable that he should appear to other people as they appeared to him. Inconceivable that they ever spoke of him among themselves, in the same freely critical and, to be quite honest, mildly malicious tone in which he was accustomed to talk of them. In his own eyes he had defects, but to see them was a privilege reserved for him alone. For the rest of the world he was surely an image of flawless crystal. It was almost axiomatic. On opening the red notebook that crystal image of himself crashed to the ground, and was irreparably shattered. He was not his own severest critic after all. The discovery was a painful one. The fruit of Jenny's unobtrusive scribbling lay before him, a caricature of himself reading. The book was upside down. In the background, a dancing couple recognisable as Gombold and Anne, beneath the legend, Fable of the Wallflower and the Sour Grapes. Fascinated and horrified, Dennis pored over the drawing. It was masterful. A mute, inglorious Rouvert appeared in every one of those cruelly clear lines. The expression of the face, an assumed aloofness and superiority, tempered by a feeble envy. The attitude of body and limbs, an attitude of studious and scholarly dignity, given away by the fidgety pose of the turned-in feet. These things were terrible. And more terrible still was the likeness, was the magisterial certainty with which his physical peculiarities were all recorded and subtly exaggerated. Dennis looked deeper into the book. There were caricatures of other people, of Priscilla and Mr. Barbecue Smith of Henry Wimbush, of Anne and Gombold, of Mr. Scogan, whom Jenny had represented in a light that was more than slightly sinister, that was indeed diabolic, of Mary and Ivor, he scarcely glanced at them. A fearful desire to know the worst about himself possessed him. He turned over the leaves, lingering at nothing that was not his own image. Seven full pages were devoted to him. Private, not to be opened, he had disobeyed the injunction. He had only got what he deserved. Thoughtfully he closed the book and slid the rubber band once more into its place. Sadder and wiser he went out on to the terrace. And so this, he reflected, this was how Jenny employed the leisure hours in her ivory tower apart. And he had thought her a simple-minded, uncritical creature. It was he, it seemed, who was the fool. He felt no resentment towards Jenny. No, the distressing thing wasn't Jenny herself. It was what she and the phenomenon of her red book represented, what they stood for and concretely symbolised. They represented all the vast conscious world of men outside himself. They symbolised something that in his studious solitariness he was apt not to believe in. He could stand at Piccadilly Circus, he could watch the crowds shuffle past, and still imagine himself the one fully conscious, intelligent individual being among all those thousands. It seemed, somehow, impossible that other people should be, in their way, as elaborate and complete as he in his. Impossible, and yet, periodically, he would make some painful discovery about the external world, 
and the horrible reality of its consciousness and its intelligence. The red notebook was one of these discoveries, a footprint in the sand. It put beyond a doubt the fact that the outer world really existed. Sitting on the balustrade of the terrace, he ruminated this unpleasant truth for some time. Still chewing on it, he strolled pensively down towards the swimming pool. A peacock and his hen trailed their shabby finery across the turf of the lower lawn. Odious birds, their necks thick and greedily fleshy at the roots, tapered up to the cruel inanity of their brainless heads, their flat eyes and piercing beaks. The fabulists were right, he reflected, when they took beasts to illustrate their tractates of human morality. Animals resemble men with all the truthfulness of a caricature. Oh, the red notebook! He threw a piece of stick at the slowly pacing birds. They rushed towards it, thinking it was something to eat. He walked on. The profound shade of a giant ilex tree engulfed him. Like a great wooden octopus, it spread its long arms abroad. Under the spreading ilex tree, he tried to remember who the poem was by, but couldn't. The smith, a brawny man, is he, with arms like rubber bands. Just like his, he would have to try and do his Muller exercises more regularly. He emerged once more into the sunshine. The pool lay before him, reflecting in its bronze mirror the blue and various greens of the summer day. Looking at it, he thought of Anne's bare arms and seal-sleek bathing dress, her moving knees and feet. A little loose with the white legs and bounding barbary. Oh, these rags and tags of other people's making! Would he ever be able to call his brain his own? Was there indeed anything in it that was truly his own, or was it simply an education? He walked slowly round the water's edge, in an embayed recess among the surrounding yew trees leaning her back against the pedestal of a pleasantly comic version of the Medici Venus, executed by some nameless mason of the Seicento, he saw Mary pensively sitting. Hello, he said for he was passing so close to her that he had to say something. Mary looked up. Hello, she answered in a melancholy, uninterested tone. In this alcove, hewed out of the dark trees, the atmosphere seemed to Dennis agreeably elegiac. He sat down beside her under the shadow of the pudic goddess. There was a prolonged silence. At breakfast that morning, Mary had found on her plate a picture postcard of Gobley Great Park a stately Georgian pile with a façade sixteen windows wide, parterres in the foreground, huge smooth lawns receding out of the picture to right and left. Ten years more of the hard times, and Gobley, with all its peers, will be deserted and decaying. Fifty years, and the countryside will know the old landmarks no more. They will have vanished as the monasteries vanished before them. At the moment, however, Mary's mind was not moved by these considerations. On the back of the postcard, next to the address, was written, in Ivor's bold, large hand, a single quatrain. Hail, maid of moonlight, bright of the sun, farewell, like plumes molted in an angel's flight. There sleep within my heart's most mystic cell, memories of morning, memories of the night. There followed a postscript of three lines. Would you mind asking one of the housemaids to forward the packet of safety razor blades I left in the drawer of my washstand? Thanks, Ivor. Seated under the Venus immemorial gesture, Mary considered life and love. The abolition of her repression, so far from bringing the expected peace of mind, had brought nothing but disquiet, a new and hitherto unexperienced misery. Ivor, Ivor, she couldn't do without him now. It was evident, on the other hand, from the poem on the back of the picture postcard, that Ivor could very well do without her. He was at Gobley now, so was Zenobia. Mary knew Zenobia. She thought of the last verse of the song he had sung that night in the garden. Le lendemain, Phyllis Pussard aurait ton mouton et chien pour un baiser que le voulage à Lisette donnait pour rien. Mary shed tears at the memory. She had never been so unhappy in all her life before. It was Dennis who first broke the silence. The individual, he began in a soft and sadly philosophical tone, is not a self-supporting universe. There are times when he comes into contact with other individuals, when he is forced to take cognizance of the existence of other universes besides himself. 
He had contrived this highly abstract generalization as a preliminary to a personal confidence. It was the first gambit in a conversation that was to lead up to Jenny's caricatures. True, said Mary, and, generalizing for herself, she added, when one individual comes into intimate contact with another, she, or he, of course, as the case may be, must almost inevitably receive or inflict suffering. One is apt, Dennis went on, to be so spellbound by the spectacle of one's own personality that one forgets that the spectacle presents itself to other people as well as to oneself. Mary was not listening. The difficulty, she said, makes itself acutely felt in matters of sex. If one individual seeks intimate contact with another individual in the natural way, she is certain to receive or inflict suffering. If, on the other hand, she avoids contacts, she risks the equally grave sufferings that follow on unnatural repressions. As you see, it's a dilemma. When I think of my own case, said Dennis, making a more decided move in the desired direction, I am amazed how ignorant I am of other people's mentality in general, and above all, and in particular, of their opinions about myself. Our minds are sealed books only occasionally open to the outside world. He made a gesture that was faintly suggestive of the drawing off of a rubber band. It's an awful problem, said Mary thoughtfully. One has to have had personal experience to realise quite how awful it is. Exactly, Dennis nodded. One has to have had first-hand experience. He leaned towards her and slightly lowered his voice. This very morning, for example, he began, but his confidences were cut short. The deep voice of the gong, tempered by distance to a pleasant booming, floated down from the house. It was lunchtime. Mechanically, Mary rose to her feet, and Dennis, a little hurt that she should exhibit such a desperate anxiety for her food and so slight an interest in his spiritual experiences, followed her. They made their way up to the house without speaking. End of chapter Chrome Yellow by Aldous Huxley Read for LibriVox.org by Martin Clifton Chapter 25 I hope you all realise, said Henry Wimbush during dinner, that next Monday is bank holiday, and you'll all be expected to help in the fair. Heavens! cried Anne. The fair! I'd forgotten all about it. What a nightmare! Couldn't you put a stop to it, Uncle Henry? Mr. Wimbush sighed and shook his head. Alas, he said, I fear I cannot. I should have liked to put an end to it years ago, but the claims of charity are strong. It's not charity we want, Anne murmured rebelliously. It's justice. Besides, Mr. Wimbush went on, the fair has become an institution. Let me see, it must be twenty-two years since we started it. It was a modest affair then. Now he made a sweeping movement with his hand and was silent. It spoke highly for Mr. Wimbush's public spirit that he still continued to tolerate the fair. Beginning as a sort of glorified church bazaar, Crome's yearly charity fair had grown into a noisy thing of merry-go-rounds, coconut shies, and miscellaneous sideshows. A real genuine fair on the grand scale. It was the local St. Bartholomew and the people of all the neighbouring villages, with even a contingent from the county town, flocked into the park for their bank holiday amusement. The local hospital profited handsomely, and it was this fact alone which prevented Mr. Wimbush, to whom the fair was a cause of recurrent and never diminishing agony, from putting a stop to the nuisance which yearly desecrated his park and garden. "'I've made all the arrangements already,' Henry Wimbush went on. "'Some of the larger marquees will be put up to-morrow. The swings and the merry-go-round arrive on Sunday.' "'So there's no escape,' said Anne, turning to the rest of the party. "'You'll all have to do something.' As a special favour, you're allowed to choose your slavery. My job is the tea-tent, as usual, Aunt Priscilla. My dear, said Mrs. Wimbush, interrupting her, I have more important things to think about than the fair. But you need have no doubt that I shall do my best when Monday comes to encourage the villagers. That's splendid, said Anne. Aunt Priscilla will encourage the villagers. What will you do, Mary? I won't do anything where I have to stand by and watch other people eat. Then you'll look after the children's sports. All right, Mary agreed. I'll look after the children's sports. And Mr. Scogan? Mr. Scogan reflected. 
"'May I be allowed to tell fortunes?' he asked at last. "'I think I should be good at telling fortunes.' "'But you can't tell fortunes in that costume.' "'Can't I?' Mr. Scogan surveyed himself. "'You'll have to be dressed up. Do you still persist?' "'I am ready to suffer all indignities.' "'Good,' said Anne, and turned to Combold. "'You must be our lightning artist,' she said. "'Your portrait for a shilling in five minutes.' "'It's a pity I'm not Ivor,' said Gombold, with a laugh. "'I could throw in a picture of their auras for an extra sixpence.' Mary flushed. "'Nothing is to be gained,' she said severely, "'by speaking with levity of serious subjects. "'And, after all, whatever your personal views may be, "'psychical research is a perfectly serious subject. "'And what about Dennis?' "'Dennis made a deprecating gesture. "'I have no accomplishments,' he said. "'I'll just be one of those men who wear a thing in their buttonholes "'and go about telling people which is the way to tea "'and not to walk on the grass.' "'No, no,' said Anne, "'that won't do. "'You must do something more than that.' "'But what? "'All the good jobs are taken, "'and I can do nothing but lisp in numbers.' "'Well, then, you must lisp,' concluded Anne. "'You must write a poem for the occasion, an ode on bank holiday. "'We'll print it on Uncle Henry's press and sell it at Tuppence a copy.' "'Sixpence,' Dennis protested. "'It'll be worth sixpence.' Anne shook her head. "'Tuppence,' she repeated firmly. "'Nobody will pay more than tuppence.' "'And now there's Jenny,' said Mr. Wimbush. "'Jenny,' he said, raising his voice, "'what will you do?' Dennis thought of suggesting that she might draw caricatures at sixpence an execution— but decided it would be wiser to go on feigning ignorance of her talent. His mind reverted to the red notebook. Could it really be true that he looked like that? "'What I will do,' Jenny echoed, "'what I will do,' she frowned thoughtfully for a moment. Then her face brightened, and she smiled. "'When I was young,' she said, "'I learned to play the drums.' "'The drums?' Jenny nodded, and, in proof of her assertion, agitated her knife and fork like a pair of drumsticks over her plate. "'If there's any opportunity of playing the drums,' she began. "'But of course,' said Anne, "'there's any amount of opportunity. "'We'll put you down definitely for the drums. "'That's the lot,' she added. "'And a very good lot, too,' said Gumbold. "'I look forward to my bank holiday. "'It ought to be gay.' "'It ought, indeed,' Mr. Scogan assented, "'but you may rest assured that it won't be. "'No holiday is ever anything but a disappointment.' "'Come, come,' protested Gumbold. "'My holiday at Crome isn't being a disappointment.' "'Isn't it?' and turned an ingenuous mask towards him. "'No, it isn't,' he answered. "'I'm delighted to hear it. "'It's in the very nature of things,' Mr. Scogan went on. "'Our holidays can't help being disappointments. "'Reflect for a moment. "'What is a holiday? "'The ideal, the platonic holiday of holidays, "'is surely a complete and absolute change. "'You agree with me in my definition?' "'Mr. Scogan glanced from face to face round the table. "'His sharp nose moved in a series of rapid jerks "'through all the points of the compass.' There was no sign of dissent. He continued, a complete and absolute change. Very well. But isn't a complete and absolute change precisely the thing we can never have? Never, in the very nature of things? Mr. Scogan once more looked rapidly about him. Of course it is. As ourselves, as specimens of Homo sapiens, as members of a society, how can we hope to have anything like an absolute change? We are tied down by the frightful limitation of our human faculties by the notions which society imposes on us through our fatal suggestibility, by our own personalities. For us, a complete holiday is out of the question. Some of us struggle manfully to take one, but we never succeed. If I may be allowed to express myself metaphorically, we never succeed in getting farther than South End. "'You're depressing,' said Anne. "'I mean to be,' Mr. Scogan replied, and, expanding the fingers of his right hand, he went on, Look at me, for example. What sort of a holiday can I take? In endowing me with passion and faculties, nature has been horribly niggardly. The full range of human potentialities is, in any case, distressingly limited. My range is a limitation within a limitation. Out of the ten octaves that make up the human instrument, I can compass perhaps two. Thus, while I may have a certain amount of intelligence, I have no aesthetic sense." While I possess the mathematical faculty, I am wholly without the religious emotions. While I am naturally addicted to venery, I have little ambition, and am not at all avaricious. Education has further limited my scope. Having been brought up in society, I am impregnated with its laws. Not only should I be afraid of taking a holiday from them, I should also feel it painful to try to do so. 
In a word, I have a conscience as well as a fear of jail. Yes, I know it by experience. How often have I tried to take holidays, to get away from myself, my own boring nature, my insufferable mental surroundings? Mr. Scogan sighed. But always without success, he added. Always without success. In my youth I was always striving, how hard, to feel religiously and aesthetically. Here, said I to myself, are two tremendously important and exciting emotions. Life would be richer, warmer, brighter, altogether more amusing if I could feel them. I try to feel them. I read the works of the mystics. They seem to me nothing but the most deplorable claptrap, as indeed they always must to anyone who does not feel the same emotion as the authors felt when they were writing. For it is the emotion that matters. The written work is simply an attempt to express emotion, which is in itself inexpressible, in terms of intellect and logic. The mystic objectifies a rich feeling in the pit of the stomach into a cosmology. For other mystics that cosmology is a symbol of the rich feeling. For the unreligious it is a symbol of nothing, and so appears merely grotesque, a melancholy fact. But I divagate. Mr. Scogan checked himself. So much for the religious emotion. As for the aesthetic, I was at even greater pains to cultivate that. I have looked at all the right works of art in every part of Europe. There was a time when, I venture to believe, I knew more about Taddeo di Pogabonzi, more about the cryptic Amico di Taddeo, even than Henry does. Today, I am happy to say, I have forgotten most of the knowledge I then so laboriously acquired. But without vanity, I can assert that it was prodigious. I don't pretend, of course, to know anything about nigger sculpture or the later seventeenth century in Italy, but about all the periods that were fashionable before 1900 I am, or was, omniscient. Yes, I repeat it, omniscient. But did that fact make me any more appreciative of art in general? It did not. Confronted by a picture, of which I could tell you all the known and presumed history, the date when it was painted, the character of the painter, the influences that had gone to make it what it was, I felt none of that strange excitement and exultation which is, as I am informed by those who do feel it, the true aesthetic emotion. I felt nothing but a great weariness of spirit. Nevertheless, I must have gone on looking at pictures for ten years before I would honestly admit to myself that they merely bored me. Since then I have given up all attempts to take a holiday. I go on cultivating my old stale daily self in the resigned spirit with which a bank clerk performs from ten till six his daily task. A holiday? Indeed. I'm sorry for you, Gumbold, if you still look forward to having a holiday. Gumbold shrugged his shoulders. Perhaps, he said, my standards aren't as elevated as yours. But personally I found the war quite as thorough a holiday from all the ordinary decencies and sanities, all the common emotions and preoccupations, as I ever wanted to have. Yes, Mr. Scogan thoughtfully agreed, yes, the war was certainly something of a holiday. It was a step beyond South End. It was Western Supermare. It was almost Ilfra Coombe. End of chapter. Chrome Yellow by Aldous Huxley. Read for LibriVox.org by Martin Clifton. Chapter 26 a little canvas village of tents and booths had sprung up, just beyond the boundaries of the garden, in the green expanse of the park. A crowd thronged its streets, the men dressed mostly in black, holiday best, funeral best, the women in pale muslins. Here and there tricolour bunting hung inert. In the midst of the canvas town, scarlet and gold and crystal, the merry-go-round glittered in the sun. The balloon man walked among the crowd, and above his head, like a huge inverted bunch of many-coloured grapes, the balloons strained upwards. With a scythe-like motion the boat swings reaped the air, and from the funnel of the engine which worked the roundabout rose a thin, scarcely wavering column of black smoke. Dennis had climbed to the top of one of Sir Ferdinando's towers, and there, standing on the sun-baked leads, his elbows resting on the parapet, he surveyed the scene. The steam organ sent up prodigious music. The clashing of the automatic cymbals beat out with inexorable precision the rhythm of piercingly sounded melodies. 
The harmonies were like a musical shattering of glass and brass. Far down in the bass the last trump was hugely blowing, and with such persistence, such resonance, that its alternate tonic and dominant detached themselves from the rest of the music and made a tune of their own, a loud, monotonous seesaw. Dennis leaned over the gulf of swirling noise. If he threw himself over the parapet, the noise would surely buoy him up, keeping him suspended, bobbing, as a fountain balances a ball on its breaking crest. Another fancy came to him, this time in metrical form. My soul is a thin white sheet of parchment, stretched over a bubbling cauldron. Bad, bad, but he liked the idea of something thin and distended being blown up from underneath. My soul is a thin tent of gut, or better, my soul is a pale, tenuous membrane. Hmm, that was pleasing, a thin, tenuous membrane. It had the right anatomical quality, tight-blown, quivering in the blast of noisy life. It was time for him to descend from the serene empyrean of words into the actual vortex. He went down slowly. My soul is a thin, tenuous membrane. On the terrace stood a knot of distinguished visitors. There was old Lord Molin, like a caricature of an English milord in a French comic paper, a long man with a long nose and long, drooping moustaches and long teeth of old ivory, and, lower down, absurdly, a short cover coat, and below that long, long legs cased in pearly grey trousers, legs that bent unsteadily at the knee and gave a kind of sideways wobble as he walked. Beside him, short and thick-set, stood Mr. Calamay, the venerable conservative statesman, with a face like a Roman bust and short white hair. Young girls didn't much like going for motor-drives alone with Mr. Calamay, and of old Lord Molin one wondered why he wasn't living in a gilded exile on the island of Capri among the other distinguished persons who, for one reason or another, find it impossible to live in England. They were talking to Anne, laughing, the one profoundly, the other hootingly. A black silk balloon towing a black-and-white striped parachute proved to be old Mrs. Budge from the big house on the other side of the valley. She stood low on the ground, and the spikes of her black-and-white sunshade menaced the eyes of Priscilla Wimbush, who towered over her, a massive figure dressed in purple and topped with a queenly toque on which the nodding black plumes recalled the splendours of a first-class Parisian funeral. Dennis peeped at them discreetly from the window of the morning-room. His eyes were suddenly become innocent, childlike, unprejudiced. They seemed, these people, inconceivably fantastic. And yet they really existed, they functioned by themselves, they were conscious, they had minds. Moreover, he was like them. Could one believe it? But the evidence of the red notebook was conclusive. It would have been polite to go and say, how do you do? But at the moment Dennis did not want to talk, could not have talked. His soul was a tenuous, tremulous, pale membrane. He would keep its sensibility intact and virgin as long as he could. Cautiously he crept out by a side door and made his way down towards the park. His soul fluttered as he approached the noise and movement of the fair. He paused for a moment on the brink, then stepped in and was engulfed. Hundreds of people, each with his own private face, and all of them real, separate and alive. The thought was disquieting. He paid tuppence and saw the tattooed woman, tuppence more, the largest rat in the world. From the home of the rat he emerged just in time to see a hydrogen-filled balloon break loose for home. A child howled up after it. But calmly, a perfect sphere of flushed opal, it mounted, mounted. Dennis followed it with his eyes until it became lost in the blinding sunlight. If he could but send his soul to follow it. He sighed, stuck his steward's rosette in his buttonhole, and started to push his way, aimlessly but officially, through the crowd. End of chapter. Chrome Yellow by Aldous Huxley. Read for LibriVox.org by Martin Clifton. Chapter 27. Mr. Scogan had been accommodated in a little canvas hut. 
dressed in a black skirt and a red bodice with a yellow and red bandana handkerchief tied round his black wig he looked sharp-nosed brown and wrinkled like the bohemian hag of frith's derby day a placard pinned to the curtain of the doorway announced the presence within the tent of Sisostris, the sorceress of Ecbatana. Seated at the table, Mr. Scogan received his clients in mysterious silence, indicating with a movement of the finger that they were to sit down opposite him and to extend their hands for his inspection. He then examined the palm that was presented him, using a magnifying glass and a pair of horn spectacles. He had a terrifying way of shaking his head, frowning and clicking with his tongue as he looked at the lines. Sometimes he would whisper, as though to himself, "'Terrible, terrible!' or "'God preserve us!' sketching out the sign of the cross as he uttered the words. The clients who came in laughing grew suddenly grave. They began to take the witch seriously. She was a formidable-looking woman. Could it be, was it possible, that there was something in this sort of thing after all? After all, they thought, as the hag shook her head over their hands, after all, and they waited with an uncomfortably beating heart for the oracle to speak. Mr. Scogan would suddenly look up and ask in a hoarse whisper some horrifying questions, such as, Have you ever been hit on the head with a hammer by a young man with red hair? When the answer was in the negative, which it could hardly fail to be, Mr. Scogan would nod several times, saying, I was afraid so. Everything is still to come, still to come, though it can't be very far off now. Sometimes, after a long examination, he would just whisper, Where ignorance is bliss, tis folly to be wise, and refuse to divulge any details of a future too appalling to be envisaged without despair. Sesostris had a success of horror. People stood in a queue outside the witch's booth, waiting for the privilege of hearing sentence pronounced upon them. Dennis, in the course of his round, looked with curiosity at this crowd of suppliants before the shrine of the oracle. He had a great desire to see how Mr. Scogan played his part. The canvas booth was a rickety, ill-made structure. Between its walls and its sagging roof were long, gaping chinks and crannies. Dennis went to the tea-tent and borrowed a wooden bench and a small union jack. With these he hurried back to the booth of Sisostris. Setting down the bench at the back of the booth, he climbed up, and with a great air of busy efficiency began to tie the Union Jack to the top of one of the tent poles. Through the crannies in the canvas he could see almost the whole of the interior of the tent. Mr. Scogan's bandana-covered head was just below him. His terrifying whispers came clearly up. Dennis looked and listened, while the witch prophesied financial losses, death by apoplexy, destruction by air raids in the next war. "'Is there going to be another war?' asked the old lady, to whom he had predicted this end. "'Very soon,' said Mr. Scogan, with an air of quiet confidence. The old lady was succeeded by a girl dressed in white muslin garnished with pink ribbons. She was wearing a broad hat so that Dennis could not see her face, but from her figure and the roundness of her bare arms he judged her young and pleasing. Mr. Scogan looked at her hand, and then whispered, "'You are still virtuous.' The young lady giggled and exclaimed, "'Oh, law! "'But you will not remain so for long,' added Mr. Scogan sepulchrally. The young lady giggled again. "'Destiny, which interests itself in small things no less than in great, "'has announced the fact upon your hand.' Mr. Scogan took up the magnifying glass and began once more to examine the white palm. "'Very interesting,' he said, as though to himself. "'Very interesting. It's as clear as day.' He was silent. "'What's clear?' asked the girl. "'I don't think I ought to tell you,' Mr. Scogan shook his head. The pendulous brass earrings which he had screwed on to his ears tinkled. "'Please, please!' she implored. The witch seemed to ignore her remark. "'Afterwards it's not at all clear. The fates don't say whether you will settle down to married life.' and have four children, or whether you will try to go on the cinema and have none. They are only specific about this one rather crucial incident. What is it? What is it? Oh, do tell me! 
The white muslin figure leant eagerly forwards. Mr. Scogan sighed. Very well, he said. If you must know, you must know. But if anything untoward happens, you must blame your own curiosity. Listen, listen. He lifted up a sharp, claw-nailed forefinger. This is what the fates have written. Next Sunday afternoon at six o'clock you will be sitting on the second stile on the footpath that leads from the church to the lower road. At that moment a man will appear walking along the footpath. Mr. Scogan looked at her hand again as though to refresh his memory of the details of the scene. A man, he repeated, a small man with a sharp nose, not exactly good-looking nor precisely young, but fascinating. He lingered hissingly over the ward. He will ask you, Can you tell me the way to paradise? And you will answer, Yes, I will show you, and walk with him down towards the little hazel copse. I cannot read what will happen after that. There was a silence. Is it really true? asked White Muslin. The witch gave a shrug of the shoulders. I merely tell you what I read in your hand. Good afternoon. That will be sixpence. Yes, I have changed. Thank you. Good afternoon. Dennis stepped down from the bench. Tied insecurely and crookedly to the tent pole, the Union Jack hung limp on the windless air. If only I could do things like that, he thought, as he carried the bench back to the tea tent. Anne was sitting behind a long table filling thick white cups from an urn. A neat pile of printed sheets lay before her on the table. Dennis took one of them and looked at it affectionately. It was his poem. They had printed five hundred copies, and very nice the quarto broadsheets looked. "'Have you sold many?' he asked, in a casual tone. Anne put her head on one side deprecatingly. "'Only three so far, I'm afraid, but I'm giving a free copy to everyone who spends more than a shilling on his tea. So in any case it's having a circulation.' Dennis made no reply, but walked slowly away. He looked at the broadsheet in his hand, and read the lines to himself relishingly as he walked along. This day of roundabouts and swings, struck weights, shied coconuts, tossed rings, switchbacks, Aunt Sally's, and all such small hijinks. But paper noses sniffed the artificial roses of round Venetian cheeks through half each carnival year, and masks might laugh at things the naked face for shame would blush at, laugh and think no blame. A holiday, but Galba showed elephants on an airy road. Jumbo trod the tightrope then, and, in the circus, armed men stabbed home for sport and died to break those dull imperatives that make a prison of every working day, where all must drudge and all obey. Sing holiday, you do not know how to be free. The Russian snow flowered with bright blood whose roses spread petals of fading, fading red, that died into the snow again, into the virgin snow, and men from all ancient bonds were freed. Old law, old custom, and old creed, old right and wrong there bled to death. The frozen air received their breath, the little smoke that died away, and round about them where they lay the snow bloomed roses. Blood was there, a red, gay flower, and only fair. Sing holiday, beneath the tree of innocence and liberty, Paper nose and red cockade dance with the magic shade that makes them drunken, merry, and strong to laugh and sing their ferial song. Free, free, but echo answers faintly to the laughing dancers. Free, and faintly laughs, and still within the hollows of the hill faintly laughs and whispers. Free, fadingly, diminishingly, free, and laughter faints away. Sing holiday, sing holiday. He folded the sheet carefully and put it in his pocket. The thing had its merits. Oh, decidedly, decidedly. But how unpleasant the crowd smelt. He lit a cigarette. The smell of cows was preferable. He passed through the gate into the park wall, into the garden. The swimming pool was a centre of noise and activity. Second heat in the young ladies' championship. It was the polite voice of Henry Wimbush. A crowd of sleek, seal-like figures in black bathing dresses surrounded him his grey bowler hat, smooth, round, and motionless in the midst of a moving sea, was an island of aristocratic calm. Holding his tortoiseshell-rimmed pince-nez an inch or two in front of his eyes, he read out names from a list. 
Miss Dolly Miles, Miss Rebecca Ballister, Miss Doris Gabell. Five young persons ranged themselves on the brink. From their seats of honour at the other end of the pool, old Lord Molin and Mr. Calamay looked on with eager interest. Henry Wimbush raised his hand. There was an expectant silence. When I say go, 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 he said. There was an almost simultaneous splash. Dennis pushed his way through the spectators. Somebody plucked him by the sleeve. He looked down. It was old Mrs. Budge. Delighted to see you again, Mr. Stone, she said in her rich, husky voice. She panted a little as she spoke like a short-winded lapdog. It was Mrs. Budge who, having read in the Daily Mirror that the government needed peach stones, what they needed them for she never knew, had made the collection of peach stones her peculiar bit of war work. She had thirty-six peach trees in her walled garden, as well as four hothouses in which trees could be forced, so that she was able to eat peaches practically the whole year round. In 1916 she ate 4,200 peaches and sent the stones to the government. In 1917 the military authorities called up three of her daughters, and what with this and the fact that it was a bad year for wall fruit, she only managed to eat 2,900 peaches during that crucial period of the national destinies. In 1918 she did rather better, for between January the 1st and the date of the armistice she ate 3,300 peaches. Since the armistice she had relaxed her efforts. Now she did not eat more than two or three peaches a day. Her constitution, she complained, had suffered, but it had suffered for a good cause. Dennis answered her greeting by a vague and polite noise. "'So nice to see the young people enjoying themselves,' Mrs. Budge went on. "'And the old people, too, for that matter. Look at old Lord Molin and dear Mr. Calamay. Isn't it delightful to see the way they enjoy themselves?' Dennis looked. He wasn't sure whether it was so very delightful after all. Why didn't they go and watch the sack races? The two old gentlemen were engaged at the moment in congratulating the winner of the race. It seemed an act of supererogatory graciousness, for after all she had only won a heat. Pretty little thing, isn't she? said Mrs. Budge huskily, and panted two or three times. Yes, Dennis nodded agreement. Sixteen, slender but nubile, he said to himself, and laid up the phrase in his memory as a happy one. Old Mr. Calamay had put on his spectacles to congratulate the victor, and Lord Molin, leaning forward over his walking-stick, showed his long, ivory teeth, hungrily smiling. "'Capital performance, capital,' Mr. Calamay was saying in his deep voice. The victor wriggled with embarrassment. She stood with her hands behind her back, rubbing one foot nervously on the other. Her wet bathing-dress shone, a torso of black, polished marble." "'Very good indeed,' said Lord Molin. His voice seemed to come from just behind his teeth, a toothy voice. It was as though a dog should suddenly begin to speak. He smiled again. Mr. Calamay readjusted his spectacles. "'When I say go, go. Go.' Splash! The third heat had started. "'Do you know, I never could learn to swim,' said Mrs. Budge. "'Really?' "'But I used to be able to float.' Dennis imagined her floating up and down, up and down on a great green swell, a blown black bladder. No, that wasn't good, that wasn't good at all. A new winner was being congratulated. She was atrociously stubby and fat. The last one, long and harmoniously continuously curved from knee to breast, had been an Eve by Cranach. But this, this one was a bad Rubens. Go, go, go. Henry Wimbush's polite level voice once more pronounced the formula. Another batch of young ladies dived in. Grown a little weary of sustaining a conversation with Mrs. Budge, Dennis conveniently remembered that his duties as a steward called him elsewhere. He pushed out through the lines of spectators and made his way along the path left clear behind them. He was thinking again that his soul was a pale, tenuous membrane, when he was startled by hearing a thin, sibilant voice speaking, apparently from just above his head, pronounce the single word disgusting. He looked up sharply. The path along which he was walking passed under the lee of a wall of clipped yew. Behind the hedge the ground sloped steeply up towards the foot of the terrace and the house. For one standing on the higher ground it was easy to look over the dark barrier. Looking up, 
Dennis saw two heads overtopping the hedge immediately above him. He recognised the iron mask of Mr. Bodiam and the pale, colourless face of his wife. They were looking over his head, over the heads of the spectators at the swimmers in the pond. Disgusting, Mrs. Bodiham repeated, hissing softly. The rector turned up his iron mask towards the solid cobalt of the sky. How long, he said as though to himself, how long? He lowered his eyes again, and they fell on Dennis's upturned, curious face. There was an abrupt movement, and Mr. and Mrs. Bodiham popped out of sight behind the hedge. Dennis continued his promenade. He wandered past the merry-go-round, through the thronged streets of the canvas village. The membrane of his soul flapped tumultuously in the noise of the laughter. In a roped-off space beyond, Mary was directing the children's sports. Little creatures seethed around her, making a shrill, tinny clamour. Others clustered about the skirts and trousers of their parents. Mary's face was shining in the heat, and with an immense output of energy she started a three-legged race. Dennis looked on in admiration. "'You're wonderful,' he said, coming up behind her and touching her on the arm. "'I've never seen such energy.' She turned towards him a face, round, red, and honest as the setting sun. The golden bell of her hair swung silently as she moved her head and quivered to rest. "'Do you know, Dennis,' she said in a low, serious voice, gasping a little as she spoke, "'do you know that there's a woman here who has had three children in thirty-one months?' "'Really?' said Dennis, making rapid mental calculations. "'It's appalling. I've been telling her about the Malthusian League. One really ought—' But a sudden violent renewal of the metallic yelling announced the fact that somebody had won the race. Mary became once more the centre of a dangerous vortex. It was time, Dennis thought, to move on. He might be asked to do something if he stayed too long. He turned back towards the canvas village. The thought of tea was making itself insistent in his mind. Tea, tea, tea. But the tea-tent was horribly thronged. Anne, with an unusual expression of grimness on her flushed face, was furiously working the handle of the urn. The brown liquid spurted incessantly into the proffered cups. Portentous in the farther corner of the tent, Priscilla, in her royal toque, was encouraging the villagers. In a momentary lull, Dennis could hear her deep, jovial laughter and her manly voice. Clearly, he told himself, this was no place for one who wanted tea. He stood irresolute at the entrance of the tent. A beautiful thought suddenly came to him. If he went back to the house, went unobtrusively, without being observed, if he tiptoed into the dining-room, and noiselessly opened the little doors of the sideboard, ah, then, in the cool recess within, he would find bottles and a siphon a bottle of crystal gin and a quart of soda-water, and then for the cups that inebriate as well as cheer. A minute later he was walking briskly up the shady yew-tree walk. Within the house it was deliciously quiet and cool. Carrying his well-filled tumbler with care, he went into the library. There, the glass on the corner of the table beside him, he settled into a chair with a volume of saint beuve There was nothing, he found, like a causerie du lundi, for settling and soothing the troubled spirits. That tenuous membrane of his had been too rudely buffeted by the afternoon's emotions. It required a rest. End of chapter Chrome Yellow by Aldous Huxley Read for LibriVox.org by Martin Clifton Chapter 28 Towards sunset the fair itself became quiescent. It was the hour for the dancing to begin. At one side of the village of tents a space had been roped off, acetylene lamps hung round it on posts, casting a piercing white light. In one corner sat the band, and, obedient to its scraping and blowing, two or three hundred dancers tramped across the dry ground, wearing away the grass with their booted feet. Round this patch of all but daylight, alive with motion and noise, the night seemed preternaturally dark. Bars of light reached out into it, and every now and then a lonely figure, or a couple of lovers, interlaced, would cross the bright shaft, flashing for a moment into visible existence, to disappear again as quickly and surprisingly as they had come. Dennis stood by the entrance of the enclosure, watching the swaying, shuffling crowd. 
The slow vortex brought the couples round and round again before him, as though he were passing them in review. There was Priscilla, still wearing her queenly toque, still encouraging the villagers, this time by dancing with one of the tenant farmers. There was Lord Molin, who had stayed on to the disorganised Passoverish meal that took the place of dinner on this festal day. He one-stepped shamblingly, his bent knees more precariously wobbly than ever, with a terrified beauty. Mr. Scogan trotted around with another. Mary was in the embrace of a young farmer of heroic proportions. She was looking up at him, talking, as Dennis could see, very seriously. What about, he wondered, the Malthusian League, perhaps? Seated in the corner among the band, Jenny was performing wonders of virtuosity upon the drums. Her eyes shone, she smiled to herself. A whole subterranean life seemed to be expressing itself in those loud rat-tats, those long rolls and flourishes of drumming. Looking at her, Dennis ruefully remembered the red notebook. He wondered what sort of a figure he was cutting now. But the sight of Anne and Gombold swimming past, Anne with her eyes almost shut and sleeping, as it were, on the sustaining wings of movement and music, dissipated these preoccupations. Male and female created he them. There they were, Anne and Gombold, and a hundred couples more, all stepping harmoniously together to the old tune of male and female created he them. But Dennis sat apart. He alone lacked his complementary opposite. They were all coupled but he, all but he. Somebody touched him on the shoulder, and he looked up. It was Henry Wimbush. "'I never showed you our oaken drain-pipes,' he said. "'Some of the ones we dug up are lying quite close to here. Would you like to come and see them?' Dennis got up, and they walked off together into the darkness. The music grew fainter behind them. Some of the higher notes faded out altogether. Jenny's drumming and the steady sawing of the bass throbbed on, tuneless and meaningless in their ears. Henry Wimbush halted. "'Here we are,' he said, and, taking an electric torch out of his pocket, he cast a dim beam over two or three blackened section of tree trunks scooped out into the semblance of pipes, which were lying forlornly in a little depression in the ground. "'Very interesting,' said Dennis, with a rather tepid enthusiasm. They sat down on the grass. A faint white glare rising from behind a belt of trees indicated the position of the dancing floor. The music was nothing but a muffled rhythmic pulse. "'I shall be glad,' said Henry Wimbush, "'when this function comes at last to an end. I can believe it. I do not know how it is,' Mr. Wimbush continued, "'but the spectacle of numbers of my fellow creatures in a state of agitation moves in me a certain weariness rather than any gaiety or excitement.' The fact is, they don't very much interest me. They aren't in my line. You follow me? I could never take much interest, for example, in a collection of postage stamps. Primitives or seventeenth-century books, yes, they're my line. But stamps, no. I don't know anything about them. They're not my line. They don't interest me. They give me no emotion. It's rather the same with people, I'm afraid. I'm more at home with these pipes. He jerked his head sideways towards the hollowed logs. The trouble with the people and the events of the present is that you never know anything about them. What do I know of contemporary politics? Nothing. What do I know of the people I see around me? Nothing. What they think of me, or of anything else in the world, what they will do in five minutes' time, are things I just can't guess at. For all I know, you may suddenly jump up and try to murder me in a moment's time. Come, come, said Dennis. True, Mr. Wimbush continued, the little I know about your past is certainly reassuring. But I know nothing of your present, and neither you nor I know anything of your future. It's appalling. In living people, one is dealing with unknown and unknowable quantities. One can only hope to find out anything about them by a long series of the most disagreeable and boring human contacts, involving a terrible expense of time. It's the same with current events. How can I find out anything about them except by devoting years to the most exhausting first-hand study? involving once more an endless number of the most unpleasant contacts. No, give me the past. It doesn't change. It's all there in black and white, and you can get to know about it comfortably and decorously, and above all, privately, by reading. By reading, I know a great deal of Caesar Borgia, of St. Francis, of Dr. Johnson. A few weeks have made me thoroughly acquainted with these interesting characters, 
and I have been spared the tedious and revolting process of getting to know them by personal contact, which I should have to do if they were living now. How gay and delightful life would be if one could get rid of all the human contacts! Perhaps, in the future, when machines have attained to a state of perfection, for I confess that I am, like Godwin and Shelley, a believer in perfectibility, the perfectibility of machinery, then, perhaps, it will be possible for those who, like myself, desire it, to live in a dignified seclusion, surrounded by the delicate attentions of silent and graceful machines, and entirely secure from any human intrusion. It's a beautiful thought. Beautiful, Dennis agreed. But what about the desirable human contacts, like love and friendship? The black silhouette against the darkness shook its head. The pleasures even of these contacts are much exaggerated, said the polite, level voice. It seems to me doubtful whether they are equal to the pleasure of private reading and contemplation. Human contacts have been so highly valued in the past, only because reading was not a common accomplishment, and because books were scarce and difficult to reproduce. The world, you must remember, is only just becoming literate. As reading becomes more and more habitual and widespread, an ever-increasing number of people will discover that books will give them all the pleasures of social life, and none of its intolerable tedium. At present, people in search of pleasure naturally tend to congregate in large herds and to make a noise. In future, their natural tendency will be to seek solitude and quiet. The proper study of mankind is books. "'I sometimes think that it may be,' said Dennis. He was wondering if Anne and Gombold were still dancing together. "'Instead of which,' said Mr. Wimbush with a sigh, "'I must go and see if all is well on the dancing floor.' They got up, and began to walk slowly towards the white glare. "'If all these people were dead,' Henry Wimbush went on, "'this festivity would be extremely agreeable. "'Nothing would be pleasanter than to read in a well-written book "'of an open-air ball that took place a century ago. "'How charming,' one would say, "'how pretty and how amusing. "'But when the ball takes place to-day, "'when one finds oneself involved in it, "'then one sees the thing in its true light.' It turns out to be merely this, he waved his hand in the direction of the acetylene flares. In my youth, he went on after a pause, I found myself, quite fortuitously, involved in a series of the most phantasmagorical amorous intrigues. A novelist could have made his fortune out of them. And even if I were to tell you, in my bald style, the details of these adventures, you would be amazed at the romantic tale. But, I assure you, while they were happening, these romantic adventures, they seem to me no more and no less exciting than any other incident of actual life. To climb by night up a rope ladder to a second-floor window in an old house in Toledo seemed to me, while I was actually performing this rather dangerous feat, an action as obvious, as much to be taken for granted, as, how shall I put it, as quotidian as catching the 852 from Surbiton to go to business on a Monday morning. Adventures and romance only take on their adventurous and romantic qualities at second hand. Live them, and they are just a slice of life like the rest. In literature they become as charming as this dismal ball would be if we were celebrating its tercentenary. They had come to the entrance of the enclosure, and stood there, blinking in the dazzling light. Ah, if only we were, Henry Wimbush added. Anne and Gombold were still dancing together. End of chapter Chrome Yellow by Aldous Huxley, read for LibriVox.org by Martin Clifton. Chapter 29 It was after ten o'clock. The dancers had already dispersed, and the last lights were being put out. Tomorrow the tents would be struck, the dismantled merry-go-round would be packed into wagons and carted away. An expanse of worn grass, a shabby brown patch in the wide green of the park, would be all that remained. Chrome Fair was over. By the edge of the pool two figures lingered. No, 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 Anne was saying in a breathless whisper, leaning backwards, turning her head from side to side in an effort to escape Gombold's kisses. No, please, no, her raised voice had become imperative. Gombold relaxed his embrace a little. Why not, he said, I will. With a sudden effort, Anne freed herself. "'You won't,' she retorted. "'You've tried to take the most unfair advantage of me.' 
unfair advantage echoed gumbold in genuine surprise yes unfair advantage you attack me after i've been dancing for two hours while i'm still reeling drunk with the movement when i've lost my head and when i've got no mind left but only a rhythmical body it's as bad as making love to someone you've drugged or intoxicated gombold laughed angrily call me a white slaver and have done with it luckily anne said i am now completely sobered and if you try and kiss me again i shall box your ears shall we take a few turns round the pool she added the night is delicious for answer gombold made an irritated noise they paced off slowly side by side what i like about the painting of degas anne began in her most detached and conversational tone oh damn degas gombold was almost shouting from where he stood leaning in an attitude of despair against the parapet of the terrace dennis had seen them the two pale figures in a patch of moonlight far down by the pool's edge he had seen the beginning of what promised to be an endless passionate embracement and at the sight he had fled it was too much he couldn't stand it in another moment he felt he would have burst into irrepressible tears dashing blindly into the house he almost ran into mr scogan who was walking up and down the hall smoking a final pipe hello said mr scogan catching him by the arm dazed and hardly conscious of what he was doing or where he was dennis stood there for a moment like a somnambulist what's the matter mr scogan went on you look disturbed distressed depressed dennis shook his head without replying worried about the cosmos eh mr scogan patted him on the arm i know the feeling he said it's a most distressing symptom what's the point of it all all is vanity what's the good of continuing to function if one's doomed to be snuffed out at last along with everything else yes yes i know exactly how you feel it's most distressing if one allows oneself to be distressed but then why allow oneself to be distressed after all we all know that there's no ultimate point but what difference does that make at this point the somnambulist suddenly woke up what he said blinking and frowning at his interlocutor what then breaking away he dashed up the stairs two steps at a time mr scogan ran to the foot of the stairs and called up after him it makes no difference none whatever life is gay all the same always under whatever circumstances under whatever circumstances he added raising his voice to a shout but dennis was already far out of hearing and even if he had not been his mind to-night was proof against all the consolations of philosophy mr scogan replaced his pipe between his teeth and resumed his meditative pacing under any circumstances he repeated himself it was ungrammatical to begin with was it true and is life really its own reward he wondered when his pipe had burned itself to its stinking conclusion he took a drink of gin and went to bed in ten minutes he was deeply innocently asleep dennis had mechanically undressed and clad in those flowered silk pyjamas of which he was so justly proud was lying face downwards on his bed time passed when at last he looked up the candle which he had left alight at his bedside had burned down almost to the socket he looked at his watch it was nearly half past one his head ached his dry sleepless eyes felt as though they had been bruised from behind and the blood was beating within his ears a loud arterial drum he got up opened the door tiptoed noiselessly along the passage and began to mount the stairs toward the higher floors arrived at the servants quarters under the roof he hesitated then turning to the right he opened a little door at the end of the corridor within was a pitch-dark cupboard-like box-room hot stuffy and smelling of dust and old leather he advanced cautiously into the blackness groping with his hands it was from this den that the ladder went up to the leads of the western tower he found the ladder and set his feet on the rungs noiselessly he lifted the trap door above his head the moonlight sky was over him he breathed the fresh cool air of the night in a moment he was standing on the leads gazing out over the dim colourless landscape looking perpendicularly down at the terrace seventy feet below why had he climbed up to this high desolate place was it to look at the moon was it to commit suicide as yet he hardly knew death the tears came into his eyes when he thought of it 
His misery assumed a certain solemnity. He was lifted up on the wings of a kind of exultation. It was a mood in which he might have done almost anything, however foolish. He advanced towards the farther parapet. The drop was sheer there and uninterrupted. A good leap, and perhaps one might clear the narrow terrace, and so crash down yet another thirty feet to the sun-baked ground below. He paused at the corner of the tower, looking now down into the shadowy gulf below, now up towards the rare stars and the waning moon. He made a gesture with his hand, muttered something, he could not afterwards remember what, but the fact that he had said it aloud gave the utterance a peculiarly terrible significance. Then he looked down once more into the depths. "'What are you doing, Dennis?' questioned a voice from somewhere very close to him. Dennis uttered a cry of fright and surprise, and very nearly went over the parapet in good earnest. His heart was beating terribly, and he was pale when, recovering himself, he turned round in the direction from which the voice had come. "'Are you ill?' In the profound shadow that slept under the eastern parapet of the tower, he saw something he had not previously noticed, an oblong shape. It was a mattress, and someone was lying on it. Since that first memorable night on the tower, Mary had slept out every evening. It was a sort of manifestation of fidelity. "'It gave me a fright,' she went on, to wake up and see you waving your arms and gibbering there. What on earth were you doing?' Dennis laughed melodramatically. "'What indeed?' he said. "'If she hadn't woken up as she did, he would be lying in pieces at the bottom of the tower. He was certain of that now. "'You hadn't got designs on me, I hope?' Mary inquired, jumping too rapidly to conclusions. "'I didn't know you were here,' said Dennis, laughing more bitterly and artificially than before. "'What is the matter, Dennis?' He sat down on the edge of the mattress, and for all reply went on laughing in the same frightful and improbable tone. An hour later he was reposing with his head on Mary's knees, and she, with an affectionate solicitude that was wholly maternal, was running her fingers through his tangled hair. He had told her everything, everything, his hopeless love, his jealousy, his despair, his suicide, as it were providentially averted by her interposition. He had solemnly promised never to think of self-destruction again, and now his soul was floating in a sad serenity. It was embalmed in the sympathy that Mary so generously poured. And it was not only in receiving sympathy that Dennis found serenity and even a kind of happiness, it was also in giving it. For, if he had told Mary everything about his miseries, Mary, reacting to these confidences, had told him in return everything, or very nearly everything, about her own. Poor Mary! He was very sorry for her. Still, she might have guessed that Ivor wasn't precisely a monument of constancy. Well, she concluded, one must put a good face on it. She wanted to cry, but she wouldn't allow herself to be weak. There was a silence. "'Do you think,' asked Dennis hesitatingly, "'do you really think that she, that Gombold, "'I'm sure of it,' Mary answered decisively. There was another long pause. "'I don't know what to do about it,' he said at last, utterly dejected. "'You had better go away,' advised Mary. "'It's the safest thing, and the most sensible. "'But I've arranged to stay here three weeks more. "'You must concoct an excuse. "'I suppose you're right.' "'I know I am,' said Mary, who was recovering all her firm self-possession. "'You can't go on like this, can you?' "'No, I can't go on like this,' he echoed. "'Immensely practical, Mary invented a plan of action. "'Startlingly, in the darkness, the church clock struck three. "'You must go to bed at once,' she said. "'I had no idea it was so late.' "'Dennis clambered down the ladder, cautiously descended the creaking stairs. "'His room was dark. "'The candle had long ago guttered to extinction. "'He got into bed and fell asleep almost at once. "'End of chapter.' Chrome Yellow by Aldous Huxley, read for LibriVox.org by Martin Clifton. Chapter 30 Dennis had been called, but in spite of the parted curtains he dropped off again into that drowsy, dozy state when sleep becomes a sensual pleasure almost consciously savoured. In this condition he might have remained for another hour if he had not been disturbed by a violent rapping at the door. "'Come in,' he mumbled, without opening his eyes. 
The latch clicked. A hand seized him by the shoulder, and he was rudely shaken. "'Get up! Get up!' His eyelids blinked painfully apart, and he saw Mary standing over him, bright-faced and earnest. "'Get up!' she repeated. "'You must go and send the telegram. Don't you remember?' "'Oh, Lord!' He threw off the bedclothes. His tormentor retired. Dennis dressed as quickly as he could and ran up the road to the village post-office. Satisfaction glowed within him as he returned. He had sent a long telegram, which would, in a few hours, evoke an answer ordering him back to town at once on urgent business. It was an act performed, a decisive step taken, and he so rarely took decisive steps, he felt pleased with himself. It was with a whetted appetite that he came into breakfast. "'Good morning,' said Mr. Scogan. "'I hope you're better.' "'Better? You were rather worried about the cosmos last night.' Dennis tried to laugh away the impeachment. "'Was I?' he lightly asked. "'I wish,' said Mr. Scogan, "'that I had nothing worse to prey on my mind. I should be a happy man.' "'One is only happy in action,' Dennis enunciated, thinking of the telegram. He looked out of the window. Great, florid, baroque clouds floating high in the blue heaven. A wind stirred among the trees, and their shaken foliage twinkled and glittered like metal in the sun. Everything seemed marvellously beautiful. At the thought that he would soon be leaving all this beauty, he felt a momentary pang, but he comforted himself by recollecting how decisively he was acting. Action, he repeated aloud, and going over to the sideboard he helped himself to an agreeable mixture of bacon and fish. Breakfast over, Dennis repaired to the terrace, and, sitting there, raised the enormous bulwark of the times against the possible assaults of Mr. Scogan, who showed an unappeased desire to go on talking about the universe. Secure behind the crackling pages, he meditated. In the light of this brilliant morning, the emotions of last night seemed somehow rather remote. And what if he had seen them embracing in the moonlight? Perhaps it didn't mean much after all. And, even if it did, why shouldn't he stay? He felt strong enough to stay, strong enough to be aloof, disinterested, a mere friendly acquaintance, even if he weren't strong enough. "'What time do you think the telegram will arrive?' asked Mary, suddenly, thrusting in upon him over the top of the paper. Dennis started guiltily. "'I don't know at all,' he said. "'I was only wondering,' said Mary, "'because there's a very good train at 3.27, and it would be nice if you could catch it, wouldn't it?' "'Awfully nice,' he agreed weakly. He felt as though he were making arrangements for his own funeral. Train leaves Waterloo, 327. No flowers. Mary was gone. No, he was blowed if he had let himself be hurried down to the necropolis like this. He was blowed. The sight of Mr. Scogan looking out with a hungry expression from the drawing-room window made him precipitately hoist the times once more. For a long while he kept it hoisted. Lowering it at last to take another cautious peep at his surroundings, he found himself, with what astonishment, confronted by Anne's faint, amused, malicious smile. She was standing before him, the woman who was a tree. The swaying grace of her movement arrested in a pose that seemed itself a movement. "'How long have you been standing there?' he asked, when he had done gaping at her. "'Oh, about half an hour, I suppose,' she said airily. You are so very deep in your paper. Head over ears. I didn't like to disturb you. You look lovely this morning, Dennis exclaimed. It was the first time he had ever had the courage to utter a personal remark of the kind. Anne held up her hand as though to ward off a blow. Don't bludgeon me, please. She sat down on the bench beside him. He was a nice boy, she thought, quite charming, and Gombold's violent insistences were really becoming rather tiresome. "'Why don't you wear white trousers?' she asked. "'I like you so much in white trousers.' "'They're at the wash,' Dennis replied rather curtly. "'This white trouser business was all in the wrong spirit. "'He was just preparing a scheme to manoeuvre the conversation back to the proper path, "'when Mr. Scogan suddenly darted out of the house, "'crossed the terrace with clockwork rapidity, "'and came to a halt in front of the bench on which they were seated. "'To go on with our interesting conversation about the cosmos,' he began, I become more and more convinced that the various parts of the concern are fundamentally discreet. But would you mind, Dennis, moving a shade to your right? He wedged himself between them on the bench. And if you would shift a few inches to the left, my dear Anne, thank you. Discreet, I think, was what I was saying. You were, said Anne. 
Dennis was speechless. They were taking their afternoon lunch and coffee in the library when the telegram arrived. Dennis blushed guiltily as he took the orange envelope from the salver and tore it open. Return at once. Urgent family business. It was too ridiculous, as if he had any family business. Wouldn't it be best just to crumple the thing and put it in his pocket without saying anything about it? He looked up. Mary's large blue china eyes were fixed upon him, seriously, penetratingly. He blushed more deeply than ever, hesitated in a horrible uncertainty. "'What's your telegram about?' Mary asked significantly. He lost his head. "'I'm afraid,' he mumbled, "'I'm afraid this means I shall have to go back to town at once.' He frowned at the telegram ferociously. "'But that's absurd, impossible!' cried Anne. She had been standing by the window talking to Gombold, but at Dennis's words she came swaying across the room towards him. "'It's urgent,' he repeated desperately. "'But you've only been here such a short time,' Anne protested. "'I know,' he said, utterly miserable. "'Oh, if only she could understand women were supposed to have intuition.' "'If he must go, he must,' put in Mary firmly. "'Yes, I must.' He looked at the telegram again for inspiration. "'You see, it's urgent family business,' he explained. Priscilla got up from her chair in some excitement. "'I had a distinct presentiment of this last night,' she said. "'A distinct presentiment.' "'A mere coincidence, no doubt,' said Mary, brushing Mrs. Wimbush out of the conversation. "'There's a very good train at 3.27.' She looked at the clock on the mantelpiece. "'You'll have nice time to pack.' "'I'll order the motor at once.' Henry Wimbush rang the bell. The funeral was well under way. It was awful, awful. "'I'm wretched you should be going,' said Anne. Dennis turned towards her. She really did look wretched. He abandoned himself hopelessly fantastically to his destiny. This was what came of action, of doing something decisive. If only he had just let things drift, if only. "'I shall miss your conversation,' said Mr. Scogan. Mary looked at the clock again. "'I think perhaps you ought to go and pack,' she said. Obediently, Dennis left the room. Never again, he said to himself, never again would he do anything decisive. Camlet, West Bowlby, Nipswich for Timpany, Spavin Delaware, and then all the other stations, and then, finally, London. The thought of the journey appalled him. And what on earth was he going to do in London when he got there? He climbed wearily up the stairs. It was time for him to lay himself in his coffin. The car was at the door, the hearse. The whole party had assembled to see him go. Goodbye, goodbye. Mechanically he tapped the barometer that hung in the porch. The needle stirred perceptibly to the left. A sudden smile lighted up his lugubrious face. "'It sinks, and I am ready to depart,' he said, quoting Landor with an exquisite aptness. He looked quickly round from face to face. Nobody had noticed. He climbed into the hearse. End of recording.